So we're in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and Paul wants to make sure that we're staying, or Timothy is staying with these fundamentals. Um, everything goes back to the fundamentals, the things that we've been taught, we head back there. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not like scientifically proven, but the way that we were raised, we tend to go back to that as we age. I mean, the things I said I, as, a, as a young man, you know, I said, uh, my dad says this, my mom says that, I'll never say these things. And then I had, my, had kids and I find myself saying the same phrases. I may try to switch them up, but I'm just like, you know what? It's been proven over time. Like those are the simple phrases and that's why, why they're said. And so you repeat those over and over back at those fundamentals. So you've been taught from your from your youth up. Look, there's a there's a type of uh, we we were at a meeting uh, last week and uh, uh, he was talking about indoctrination. And afterwards, he said he goes, I just don't like the word indoctrination. I said, and I use the word doctrination, like we're doctrinating, we're teaching these fundamentals. We're not indoctrinating because we're not. Uh, it's not to a cultish end, we're doctrinating from the Word of God, we're teaching these fundamentals so that when things go wrong, this week uh, we were at an active shooter training uh, with the conservation officers, Caleb and Nathan and I were civilians, and so we, we played different roles uh, in the active shooter training, and what they do is they stick them in a building, stick those officers in a building, and so the first two days were just literal walk through training this is how if it's a two-man team if it's a one-man team if it's a three-man team this is how you check doors if it's a one-man team speed is your friend if it's a three-man team then you can clear every room as you move you can watch behind you is there uh, are there clues is is there noise is there you know if you're hearing gunshots you're really not going to look at the rooms you're you're headed to the place where where uh, the noise is coming from, if there are people saying, he's up there, he's up there, I mean, taking in all those clues while when adrenaline takes place, one of the first things that happens when adrenaline takes place with any person is they get tunnel vision. They lose their peripheral vision. They become very, very focused. And so they're trying to get them to focus on their training over and over. So the first two days was, was exactly how to breach the rooms, how to hold how to hold your weapon, how to have muzzle control, all of that kind of stuff, especially if, we, if you're with other people, not cross-shooting, trusting your partner. And, and you would see it progress as the week went on. As they're walking through, they're stopping. There's a two-man team. The person on the right quits looking to the left. You can't cover both sides. you got a partner. He has to do his job. You have to do your job. And so, do da 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 And then Friday is live training. They have guns. Civilians, the civilians uh, have guns. There are bodies that have been shot, so some people are wounded, and they're hollering for help and help me. And all at the same time, you know, there's a dead person, somebody wounded, uh, an officer moving in. Every second is another shot, boom, another victim, boom, another victim, boom, another victim. You know, they used to teach them, if you come there alone, you stand and wait, you secure the... Um, scene and you wait for backup and the SWAT teams are trained to do this and after the school shootings they said we can't have one guy standing out by his car because every second is a shot a shot like you have to go in and the whole idea is if he's shooting at the police officer he's not shooting teachers and children and that's a terrible way to be and it's terrible to even think of but it's the new way of training it was fun to watch the instructors come out of that, how they've been trained in the past and move into this new training. And on Friday, bam, here it is. All the adrenaline. You get, you get shot with a simunition and it's alive. You're alive. You know, you know it hits you. It's there. Nathan got shot in the hand and he was like, okay, no more skin contact with those things. I mean, it's sharp, you know, and you know, you know you've been shot. So, uh, they're moving through, they're being shot at, they're returning fire. And, and what you're doing is you're trying to get them to a place. They played loud music. We were hollering for help. We were in the back as victims. One time we were hostages and, man, there's a lot going on. And what you want them to do is when they go in, you don't want them to think. I mean, that's the detriment uh, of their movement. If they begin to think, they die. They have to react. 
It has to be a reaction. The training has to be there. So they have training every year, every year, every year, you know, because they don't do it. And if you don't train every year, when it comes time to do it in five years, you go, oh, what, what were we supposed to Oh, yeah, I need to get this. What else was I supposed to It's too late. Things are happening. And that's how this is. Paul, Paul's telling Timothy, look, everything's going awry. Everything's going bad. You're looking around. It says the days of Noah. Things are, people are, uh, are, are doing that which is right in their own eyes. They have a form of, good, uh, a form of godliness, but de, or a form of knowledge, but a uh, form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. They, they are, it's Christianity an inch deep. It's secularism on the move. It's the world in the church. And what are you going to do, Timothy? Then what? Go with the flow? No, remember your training that you got from your mother and your grandmother. That you've been taught from your youth up. That you've seen in me. And that's where he is here in, in, uh, in verse number 10 of 2 Timothy 3. I'm, I'm going to move you over to Acts, so just stay there. He says, but thou hast fully known, and we looked at these last week, my doctrine, his proclamations, the things that he said. Uh, we, we recite scripture. You know, we, we share scripture with one another uh, as we're doing things. But I have, I have uh, just sayings of life. You know, I'll say this all the time. I say this all the time. And I'm now starting to hear the boys when somebody says something, they'll repeat that saying, because we, we, I've said it to him over and over. I will say, love is, and John will say, an emotion that shows itself out of a right action. I mean, you've heard that over and over and over. You see love, an emotion shows itself out of right action. Was that the right action? No, that's not love. You know, you begin to be trained by hearing those definitions over and over and over. You know, and I, I think Annabelle was over today, and and we've watched her some, and she's hyper, and, uh, and uh, sit down, hear, move, no, stay. I mean, just simple commands, demands, simple obedience. Go, stop, come, close, all of those things, roll over, shake, all those things that you've taught uh, with your dog, you know, you've trained that hopefully into your kids. And I, and I was like, the ultimate test is if they're running towards the road, if you put a bowl of candy in the road, and they run towards the road, can you say stop and them not have a conversation with you on their way there? Do they listen to the command? Stop, you know, because you are in command of their safety. They are in focus of their, of their food. You know, in the last scenario, when the, there was two, two man teams, two person teams, in the last scenario, two people came in together and there was an obvious gunman and he had shot two people, and we were laying in the middle of the floor. And then there was a gunman in the back corner. So when they came around the corner and brought their weapon up, there was the gunman with a gun. There's no talking once they have a gun anymore. There's no talking. You, you put them down. So two shots. He goes down. They rush in. The guy in the corner shoots them. Because their training says, don't rush in. Every corner has to be cleared. Just because you've got one, don't let the adrenaline of that action take you off focus. You know, there was one of the guys, is a new officer, is a Marine. And so, I mean, he just, because of his training, very, there's, you, you, don't, you weren't teaching. Like, he was doing what he was taught. And so he comes in, two to the chest on Nathan, Literally, I mean, two to the chest on Nathan, turns to the two to the chest on Caleb, gun around the back, move, move, gun, hands around the back, cuff, cuff, go over, handgun out, in, turn over, cuff, cuff, uh, patients dead, patients dead, two patients dead on the scene, two victims, shooters, one's wearing this, one's wearing that, it gets done, you're just like, whoo wee, that's a lot of training. You know, an average citizen would just have at your adrenaline would just blow you up. He's saying here, remember Timothy, you were with me. You'll see that in over in Acts chapter 16. He says, My 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 doctrine, the things that I taught you, the things that I said, my my manner of life. Look, 
the Bible says that the anger of man worketh not the righteousness of God. And I've heard some, some preachers use that recently. And they've used it because when they were growing up, maybe they had a temper. And their parents would use that verse on them all the time. The anger of man work, working not the righteousness of God. And now they're at a place in their life where when they get angry, what does their training say? But I don't know if it's the Holy Spirit or just your conscience starts just reciting that voice, that verse out loud in your head. The anger of man working not the righteous. Man, I want to be angry. Be angry and sin not. So I can be angry. Yeah, but don't sin. You can, have, you can have a pulse. I think every Christian should have a pulse. I think we should be passionate. I think, we, I think there should be some aggression that's in us. You know, I think there should be some compassion. If we're going to reach in the lion's mouth and save, pull them, saving them from the fire, there's going to be some energy and there's going to be a, a, a heightened experience. And so there's going to be some passion, but at the same time, sin not. Because our adversary is not man. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We're, we're all... Uh, brothers and sisters in Adam, and we're all brothers and sisters under the the doctrine of being all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. They're only acting in the way that they are because they are sinners. So I'm to forgive my enemy. I'm to forgive them that spitefully. I'm I'm plugging those truths into my brain. He says, "You've seen my manner of life, man." One of the great greatest litmus tests for any Christian is to talk to the Christian that hangs out with them all the time. How does she act? How does he act? How does she act when she gets mad? How does he act when he gets mad? How does she act when she's wronged? How does he act when he's wronged? Paul tells Timothy boldly, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you know my manner of life. Look, I'm not, I'm not sure my manner of life always reflects the glory of God. But Paul says to Timothy, you know my manner of life. You know my purpose. What over and over Paul writes in the in uh, the epistles, uh, what is the purpose of this? For the sake of the gospel, you know my purpose. I'm, I'm living now for the sake of the gospel. My long suffering. He's just steady. He just does it over and over and over and over. His charity, uh, his he is what he has an action of love to other. His patience. You know, Paul. Paul was the was the Good Samaritan. His patience, he, he would wait. Uh, he wasn't reactive. His persecutions. Look, I think many times we're re, we're re, we're, we are reactive due to the fact that we are trying to preserve ourselves. And so we react because there's a self-preservation. Look, we're already preserved. I think we have to understand positionally who we are in Christ. I'm already preserved. If I'm Typically, if I'm in a position where I'm trying to preserve myself... I've stepped, stepped outside of the bounds of, of glorifying God, and now I've made a statement. I'm trying to rectify that, and I'm preserving myself. The real probably move of preservation should be an apology, and then forgiveness, and then moving forward with that, not trying to... Look, none of us are always right. I mean, I, I, I always say there's one of us that's uh, wrong, and the other one's me. You know, that's what I always say to Marcy. One of us is wrong, and the other one's me. And she'll for a minute, no, that's not right. You're wrong, and I'm right. And uh, when the kids were growing up, and I quit doing this, because <laughs> when the kids were growing up, I would say something, and, and I would say, you know, because Dad's always right. You know, and they started doing that to Marcy. And then she would say something, say, no, this is what Dad said, and he's always right. You know, and I was like, okay, we better shut that down. <laughs> that training's going to get me sleeping in my own bedroom. So patience, and then we come across these three, three things that take place in his life. He has persecutions, he has uh, suffering, and he has afflictions. And he names the places, Antioch, and Iconia, and Lystra. Uh, in the persecutions, uh, look there, you're in Acts, look back in chapter number 8. He says, you know the things that befell me in persecutions. Acts chapter 8, verse number 1 says, And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at the time there was a great, there's that word, persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered 
abroad throughout all the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. It's interesting that those two places are used because in the Great Commission he's go, he tells them to go to Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. The persecutions are going to do what? They were pers- purposeful. They were going to press. They, they met in the upper room. You know what they would have done? The same thing that the lost people do. They would have got together and they would have massed in a large group. You know, there are a couple of denominations right now shutting down their small peripheral churches because they would like all those small peripheral churches are, are eating away at their finances and they want those people to leave those churches and go to the larger conglomerate church where all the finances can be in one place. But I will say, uh, if there was a, if a church down the road shut down and that whole group of 100 came up here and, and joined our church at first, you'd be like, man, that's awesome. We got 100 new people. But our circle of influence is here at Carr Township, and I'm different than, no doubt, than somebody else's pastor and vice, vice versa. And the influence that they had up there is now gone. And now we have deacons that were in a church, Sunday school teachers that were in church, piano players were in church, uh, workers and people that are used. And you have two churches trying to exist under the same church, and it won't be long. It won't be long before you before you have tension between the groups. Look, it's good for God to add to the church. You know what the best addition to every church is? New converts. People that can be taught the word of God. I'm not against any other group, and all everybody seems to have some kind of experience with church or being in church. But at the same time, a new convert where you can say, this is what the Bible teaches, and you can take them to those chapter verses, and they can just grow in the Lord. There is going to be a great persecution. Matthew 13, 21 says, ye hath not, ye, ye yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he is offended. And that's talking about the weaker Christian. When persecutions arise, what happens? They don't go back to their training because there wasn't any training. What's the Bible say about being offended? If we are offended, go to that brother. If he will not hear you, take a brother. If they, if they won't hear them, bring it before the church. But the Bible also says something about uh, offense as well. Great peace have they that love thy law. How much will offend them? Nothing will offend them. Look, at, I think as we grow in Christ, we should have a better understanding of just the human experience and the human idea, the way that humans think. And and uh, if somebody intends to be offensive, when we probably should pray for them, not for God's judgment. Maybe we can pray that they just get their heart right with the Lord and then have a conversation. But I don't need Eddie to apologize to me if he's offensive for me to be right with God. Now, maybe I could say, well, but I'm the policeman and I don't want him to be offending anybody else. God's the policeman. And we're just servants of the Most High God. That's it. And so there's going to be persecutions. Look over there in Acts chapter 13, verse number 50. It says, but the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city, and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of the coast. I think they were here, they were maybe in Lystra. That's going to be something we're going to look at in a minute. But so there were persecutions. In 2 Corinthians uh, 12 and verse 10, the Bible says, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities. Paul says, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then am I strong. I mean, so he says, look, I, I take pleasure in the persecution. And not that it's some kind of deviant mind, but it is at least the press back from the world. You know, the idea would be uh, that the world could not get along with the holy man, holiest man that ever lived. So how could it get along with you? You know, the idea is that that our presence because of Christ in a world where Satan is the prince and power of the air, the little god of this world, there should be some there should be some friction because of my presence. Not not in my manners, not in not in how I treat people and act, 
Not because, I, not because I'm a Bible thumper and, and I'm rude and inconsiderate, but just because of my presence and, my, and that's back there to Timothy, that manner of life. There are persecutions, then there are sufferings. In Romans 8.18 it says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not to be compared with the glories which shall be revealed in us. 2 Corinthians 1.5 for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth to Christ. Colossians 1.24 Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. And then from that is in Colossians 1.24 those afflictions. Hebrews 10.32 But call to remembrance the former days in which after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of affliction. And affliction comes, sufferings come, persecutions come. Let's just be honest, they come from everywhere. They can come from the people in your own home. They can come from work. You get right with God and you can make your house a wreck. And in your house can be other Christians. And just because you're right with God, you unsettle the cart because you're right with God and those Christians in your home are not. And you just make, you just make it a wreck. You know, I, I, I've, I've had complaints at times where, where I've had individuals come to me and just say, uh, he comes home and he reads his Bible every night. That was a frustration. And so I, I looked at him and I looked back at her and I said, are you reading your Bible every night? And she just said, no. And I said, why not? I said, what you're frustrated with is he's doing what he should be doing. And you're not, and the fact that he's doing it, it's not only just you, but it's the Holy Spirit as well revealing to you. Because, look, you can't watch TV every night and be on your phone every night or your computer every night and not read the Word of God while somebody else comes apart from that stuff and reads God's Word and not just feel wrong about it. I mean, if Marcy was going to do it in our house, I'd say, Go to the bedroom so I at least don't have to see you. Go back there and be with God so I don't have to see you or be around it. Don't be preachy to me. You know, every time something goes on, she'll say, well, the Bible says, or she'll send me a verse, this is going on today, and she'll send a verse, this is going on, she'll send a verse, and I'm just like, stop being preachy to me and complain with me. You know, stop giving me Bible verses. Quit trying to make me think godly. I just want to be mad for a minute going to call Jeff instead if you don't stop doing that. And so there are there, there are these afflictions. 1 Peter 5 9 says, Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. At Antioch, look there in chapter 13 and verse number 14 of Acts. It says, But when they departed from uh, Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. Like I'm telling you, anywhere Paul went, he went to the synagogue first. And it's almost like he, he brought on his own persecution. It was like he didn't try to sneak into the town. He just went right to the head of the snake. And he said, I'm here. Let's talk about Jesus. He probably said, let's talk about God, and they said, okay, and sat down, and then he talked about Jesus, which just probably infuriated them. We can talk about God all you want, just don't mention Jesus being God. You know, early in, in Acts, Peter said, who you crucified? <laughs> Woo, man, that got in there, girl. And guess what happened? They, they flogged him a little bit and said, don't do it, don't do it no more. And he said, what am I supposed to do, obey God or man? I, I don't know what to do. Would you obey God or man? And, I, and I've asked people that before. Would you have me to obey God or man? And one of the persons that I said that to said, I would never ask you to compromise your stand with God. And I was like, then stop doing it. I was told I could no longer talk about God on the job. And I could no longer play Christian music on the job site. I said, I quit. No, no, that's not what I want. Okay, can he play QMF? Well, yeah. Then I can play Gold City. Can he talk about 
GD this and all cuss words this and all that? Yep, then I can too. Can he talk about, look, you can't stop it. It can't be censored. You know what's bizarre is that that, that you would work in a place of business where, and, and I'm saying how it should be, but you're on time, you work hard, you're friendly, you do the, what they ask you to, and they're mad because you're a Christian. But you know what you don't do after work? You don't go out and drink with us. You don't do the company parties. You know, you don't participate in the joke telling. You, well, they don't have nothing to do with work. And they would say, we don't want your kind. That's crazy business practice. But that's the friction. That's the, that's the difference. If you had an entire business of godly men and godly women, man, you could build something just like with Noah this morning. If you have somebody that's pursuing to do right, man, you can build something. You can build something. And so we see here that they go to Antioch. He goes into the synagogue and he just says, I'm here. I mean, he, I, I, I don't know that he stirred his own pot, but we know by reading it, he stirred his own pot. He's here. Paul is here. And so in Antioch and Pisidia, for an account of the persecutions encountered by St. Paul, look there in chapter number 13. We're not, we won't read the whole thing, but in chapter number 13, we get all of these, and he's with Barnabas. He ends up, he ends up in all three places, Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. Look there in chapter number 14. I think it's right in the beginning. It says, And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews. And so spake a great multitude both of the Jews and also of the Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews, what they do? Boy, they stirred up the Gentiles. Stirred them up. Man, Paul was going to be the apostle to the Gentiles. The Jews did not like the Gentiles. You know, it's crazy today to to see the anti-Semitism from American people that are lost towards Jews as well as the secular world, as well as, as Islam and those things. But very little support anymore even. We're starting to get these uh, Christian groups that are no longer supporting uh, Israel, no longer supporting uh, the Jews. Uh, I remember listening to... Uh, to the Judeo-Christian, not Judeo-Christian, what is Messianic Jews uh, program on AM 900 when I was young. And man, people would call in and just say, that is not in the Bible. They ha- are separated. They rejected God. They can't be saved. The whole lot of them Jews. And they, man, they just couldn't stand the fact that a Jew may know Christ as their Savior. I'm like, glory be to God how the life of a Jew would change if he met Jesus, how that would change. Paul was a Jew. Peter was a Jew. I mean, what in the world? These these individuals were Jews as well, and they were getting saved, serving the Lord. You think the first church was just full of Gentiles? Absolutely not. And so they're there. They endure. Chapter number 16, look there in chapter number 16 and verse number 1. It says, Then came he to... Derby and Lystra, or Derb and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, and believed, but his father was a Greek. Which was well reported by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him, and took him to circumcise him, because the Jews which were him in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Gentile. But they they were what? I mean, he's not only a half breed, but he's a but. He's part Greek and part Jew, like he's an outcast. And, and I don't know if you know this, I know you've probably heard it, but Jesus, as Jesus is traveling, he just keeps passing back and forth through this one portion, one part of the country, and it's Samaria. When, when the Jews came back to rebuild uh, Israel, the Samaritans stayed in captivity, and they intermarried. So whenever the Samaritans finally came back to Israel, the Jews built roads around Samaria because they said they were half-breeds. They were not pure-breed, purebred Jews, and they hated them. And so who passes by? You know, uh, uh, a priest, uh, a Levite, 
and the Good Samaritan comes by, and who does the work? The Good Samaritan has compassion on the on the individual on the road. And so he just keeps going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth through Samaria. And I think what he's doing in, I say indoctrination, he is he's breaking down the normal tendencies of what every Jew had been taught, you know, for a lifetime from their parents and, and grandparents. Those Samaritans, they're not the real deal. They're not the real thing. They're less than. It's bizarre to me, I'm just saying, to see uh, white Christians be anti-black to be racist and be and be against blacks or be against uh, Hispanics. It blows my mind because I'm just like, we are, we're truly of one blood. We're all from, uh, you know, we would say Adam, but Noah was the very place that we eventually all come from. And so uh, you go back and every region looking into their history has a flood account because the flood account would have left there with Ham, Shem, and Japheth when they left. And that would have been passed on for generation and generation. And so what are they? are they? Are they a soul that needs to be saved? Absolutely. And so I'm, I'm just not a, big, I'm not a big fan of, and I wasn't much of a fan before I got saved, but I'm not a fan of any bigotry or uh, racism or anything. I just, I just don't like it. And, and to be honest with you, there are as many just no good white people as there are of any other group. And, uh, and if that's the way we're going to classify people, then we're not going to have any compassion on anybody. You can't have compassion on one group and be compassionless for another group. You are just compassionate. You see a person that has need. Look, I, I was on 265 the other day, and a car was pulled over with a flat tire, and it was a black lady. And I mean, what? I was like, nope, just drive on by. Good luck. Nope, pulled over, put my flashes on, backed up to her, got out, walked back. Can I help you? I don't know if I, she was more scared of me than anything. I mean, it's, it's the time that we live in. and She couldn't get a jack out of the car. So pick stuff up, jack out, down, up. Who's your helpers pulled up? Thank you, thank you, thank you. In the truck, shh, gone. Don't, I don't need her to bow, pay me, thank me. Look, it's just the, this is how we are. That's how we, we should be. We, we see somebody that needs help pulled right up next to a car. Um, at Lowe's maybe, where were we the other day, pulled up next to, we we got lunch and pulled over there and we were sitting there eating and a guy pulled up and they were trying to load their stuff and I didn't look at his race, I didn't look at his color, you know, I'll be honest with you, I don't even look if they're gay or straight, I don't care, there are humans that if I'm going to affect them, I'm going to have to have some compassion on them and so I didn't notice that she was a he or trying to be that all rhymes, and that's pretty good. He was a she, or trying to be, and she was a she with the he, she. I didn't look at all of that. I put my sandwich down, got out, and said, can I help you? You could tell there was this. And I didn't say, I'm an independent, fundamental, Baptist, Bible thumper. And you too, if you don't get your, I didn't do that. The wind was blowing real hard. They had two, uh, doors on there and the wind was blowing stuff around and so I said hold that and I picked it up they got the other end put that stuff in strapped it down got bent we ate lunch I didn't think two shakes about it just don't think about it just people need help you help them I don't pull my phone out and video them if they're bleeding out just get down and help them I mean, that's the church is going to make a difference by doing I mean I we spend a lot of time in judgment. Miss Powell just sent me a, a a group text. I don't know if anybody else. Did you get that, Linda? And so I just got a group text from uh, from Miss Powell. And it's a new book that's out that uh, there are actually two books. One of the questions in the book uh, asks, why does somebody need forgiveness? It's a narrated book. The author has a deep, he's supposed to represent God. And so in the narrated book, the narrator says to the little girl that asks the question, why do I need forgiveness? The, the God type voice speaks out and says, you don't, because we're truly, no one is a sinner, everyone is. 
It's a different kind of indoctrination. It's that sin doesn't exist. That you and I are perpetrating this on the world. And this is the kind of teaching that they're getting. And the only way that I'm going to brush them up to their need of salvation is to to eventually for the Holy Spirit to reveal to them that they are a sinner. And that won't be by my rebuking of a lost person. That will be by showing them Jesus Christ. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. So just being there. Thank you. You're welcome. You guys have a good day. Are you going somewhere close where you need help getting it out? No, we can do it. Okay. I mean, who would ask that? Just a guy in the parking lot? Being what? Trying to be a good Samaritan? How would that change the nature of the world? I mean, you can wear your Car Township t-shirt out and then rip the people at the fast food restaurant because they don't get your food right. And they can say, oh, they go to Car Township Baptist. Or you can wear your Car Township t-shirt in town and be a good Samaritan and they can look and say, oh, they go to Car Township Baptist. And really, it's not because you go here that makes you a good Samaritan. I'd like to hope that the influence is that. But that your influence has been influenced by God. Timothy, Paul is telling Timothy, look, you know these things about me. And you were with me during these sufferings and during these afflictions. What did he do? Let's turn back to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and we'll see. Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 11. These persecutions and afflictions came to him at Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. He said, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. And that's something that we should know. That's something, you got your Bible out? Why not get it out? Okay. That's something that we should know. I, that... Even during times of great persecution, what's the ultimate deliverance? Execution, separation from this world, entrance into the portals of heaven. I mean, that would be the end game of of an ultimate persecution. Recant or die. Recant or die. Uh, I I read read in uh, one of those magazines the other day, I don't know if you had it or, I, or where I picked it up. And it, and it said that uh, a gunman walked into a church, told, told people to come forward and recant. The first three gentlemen, the pastor uh, and the two deacons, came forward and recanted, and they set them down on the chairs. And the fourth person was a little girl about 10 years old. And she came forward. They, had, they put a Bible on the ground. That was what it was. Spit on that, recant, and and they recanted and sat down. This little 10-year-old girl come and got on her knees and started praying. And so they walked over and took those three guys, took them to another room and shot them and said, if your religion isn't worth standing for, then you don't need to live. And the police got there and ran them off. And I'm like, the faith of a 10-year-old girl in the face of, of adversity did what? Scream, run to her mom, quiver? No. Well, she'd had some training. She got on her knees and said, you know, thank you, Lord, for the life you've given me, for my parents, for my Savior. And she lives. Paul says, I, God delivered me from them all. Yea, all and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. These are those persecutions. His, his problems were his afflictions. But evil men and seducers should act worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, but continue on the things that thou hast learned and assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them and from a child. So he says, but continue, and that continuation is this, is this going back to these fundamentals. What do we know? Uh, what do we know about baptism? What do we know about uh, speaking in tongues? What do we know about uh, the Lord's Supper. What do we know? Look, searching into these scriptures on these events, looking at, looking at Ruth, looking at uh, Nineveh and Jonah today, looking at Noah, looking at uh, 
all of these different events of faith, looking in and seeing Christ in them, seeing His presence, seeing His work, seeing how He relates to the New Testament, seeing how He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and all of the time. But, but there are some culprits of this life, and they are evil men and seducers. They are described as evil men who have persecuted Paul and false teachers who have endeavored to lead us astray. False teachings. Like, like it says in that email, it says, uh, Christians should not judge. You know, it's crazy. Uh, I think Grace asked me the other day. Uh, she said, that verse is right after. The Bible says, judge not lest you be judged. And I said, yeah, and right after that is the verse that says, the spiritual man judgeth all things. And she goes, well, then what does it mean? And I said, well, it means that I shouldn't hold other people to a different standard than I hold myself to. That would be hypocritical judgment. And so I hear people say, I mean, it's just, it's like it's increasing. And, it's, and it'll disappear for a little bit. And somebody will say something and it just ramps right back up. And I see, I see the goofiest people on Facebook trying to tell me how to interpret the Bible on how, I, as a Christian, I shouldn't be judgmental. Just let people live how they want. Uh, two of the articles that I that I included today, what we're headed to, and I've told you this, man, it's been for half a year, but I've got a whole list of, of pictures. We'll probably have the kids step out for the Sunday evening. And I've got a whole list of pictures that I have taken off of Facebook of different events that have happened. Uh, the, the SBC president, so the Baptist Church president, said last week, He's demanding that all of the pastors in the Southern Baptist movement call the LGBTQ group by their preferred pronoun. And he's demanding it. Or they're going to withhold funds. I mean, he's serious about it. And I'm just like, what? A, why would there even be a statement made? Look, if there's somebody that's wicked, take them out of the pulpit. But just preach the word. You know, next week, maybe to my demise, if somebody, the wrong person is visiting, but I'm going to say he took upon the ark one male and one female. Because if, if that race or line of animals is going to continue, that's how it must be done. And he doesn't have to take a whole book of the Bible and say, this is how things must be. It's just common nature that that's how it must be. If it had took all male dogs, guess what? There'd be no dogs. That's just all there is to it. And so he took one male and one female. He's God. He knows what he's doing. That's how it is. Uh, Cal California in, two, in 2022 will be a gender-free state. That means from the age of zero to five. If you go to the hospital and you have a child, it'll just have a name with no gender. And the parent's name, and at five years old, with the help of the school, that child will choose what gender it desires to be. Man, you talk about a nightmare just and about getting ready to be stirred up. But that's how things are going. You know, things are going to get wild. Things are, you say, well, that will never happen here. We're, they say we're five years out. Everything that happens in California, we're five years out. And so just in five years, man, that wave is just going to... Wild what? While, while, I was just thinking that as you were saying that, while we have a more conservative than liberal president, these things are happening. You know, it's, it's bizarro, and, uh, and that's what's taking place. And what, so what are we going to do in the midst of all that? You know, somebody said the other day, if Christians don't get out and, vo and vote, American Christianity is going to cease to exist. Guess what, friend? long as God's on the throne, American Christianity ain't going to seek to exist. Yeah, it may go underground for a little bit, and it may have to be done more in secret than in the open like this, but, it, but God ain't going nowhere. And as things have waxed worse and worse in every group, there's always been a group of people that have just stayed the course for Jesus Christ. You know what's going to happen if it gets totally horrible in this country? People are still going to get saved. There'll still be people that get Say, because the power is in the Word of God. America's desire for Christianity to be pushed into the ocean is not greater than God's power to save a soul that's in need. But that's where you, you know, I'm saying we're seeing, we're seeing 
you know, next Sunday I will say, you know, we're, we are Sunday morning now for probably six, six weeks. We are full on Sunday morning. On Sunday night, we're less than half, and on Wednesday night, we're less than that. And I know in Wednesday night, we got a lot of people doing stuff. But the Bible says, literally says, as we see the day approaching, forsake not the assembling of ourselves together so much the more as we see the day approaching. And that is the slow cooker of our of Christianity. I mean, other, other denominations, and don't think I haven't thought about it, other denominations have just done away with Sunday nights altogether. It's like it's just a waste of time, and nobody's coming. And so it's just a waste of time. And, and, and I was probably headed down that line, and I was just like, you know what, like today would have been a good day just to be home and to not do anything, you know. And, but I had somebody come to me and say, we're leaving your church because you all assemble too much. And when they said that, I was like, you know what, I'll never shut Sunday nights down. <laughs> Not as long as there's breath in me. I was just like, because where two or more are gathered in his name, he's there in the midst, you know. So we'll just, we'll just do it. And as long as I got kids in my house, there'll at least be two of us here because I can make them come. So there you go. So they are going to, there's going to be a decline. They're going to wax worse and worse. And there's going to be a, da- a damnation. They're going to be, there's going to, being deceived, going to be deceived. Evil, evil men were seducers and deceiving. And there's a warning in that in every New Testament book of seducers and false teachers. And then we move to the last section. We move to the learning of Timothy. In verse number 14, he says, Continue thou on th- those things. He had what? Steadfastness in his learning. The learning that Timothy had acquired will do him no good unless he is steadfast in practicing what he had learned. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you to be removed from the truth to another gospel? The the Bible verses be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Not not surviving, abounding in the work of the Lord. There's all kinds of work. The fields are white unto harvest, but the labors are few. There's all kinds of work. Do not, in these last days, get tunnel vision on the Lord. There's all kinds of work. Do not shut yourself off, despite what your flesh says, when it says in your personality. And and I told Marcy the other day, I said, you know, sometimes I just like to have something where I just went there by myself. I worked by myself. I came home, was by myself, and I was like, and, and it sounds good, and it might even feel good for a time, but you know what happens in that whole self-existence? No ministry takes place at all. Now, there are some times when I may need to come up part and be by myself, but really I just need to be with the Lord for a time of refreshing, and that refreshing is only to insert myself back into the world. I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about uh, as Four Seasons makes it whatever it's going to do. I, I've been sleepless over. Did I witness enough? Did I tell enough? Did I shake enough hands? Did I say hey enough? There are guys in there I'm, I'm pro- I won't see again. I don't see outside of, of that circle. Was I kind enough? Compassion enough? Did I love enough? Did I touch the guy on, on the back and, and give him love? Uh, they showed a picture of the president today and he was shaking the hand of a guy who had had both arms amputated at the elbows and he shook his hand and it was plastic. And he and the president reached up and touched his face. And they asked him afterwards, they said, why did you touch his face? Because most people would be like, don't touch my face. And he said, because I wanted to have human contact with him. He wanted to touch him and say, thanks for your service. And he wanted him to feel, feel his hand on his skin. Thanks for your service. And he said there was no other skin exposed, so, so that's where I touched him. They asked the guy, they said, were you uncomfortable when the president touched you on the face? He said, no, it was good to feel his touch. That's crazy what the power of touch can do. But I'm asking myself, did I do enough? And man, I have to be honest with you, when I look in the mirror of judgment, I have to say no. I didn't do enough. I thought the very thing the devil wanted me to think, you've got more time. 
we got plenty of time. I should have been busy on those mornings when I was ornery or tired or upset. And I just sit over there and pout and drink my, I'm just going to, I'm going to intermittent fast for the next 30 days. So what are you going to do? Just sit over here and drink my coffee and be mad because I can't eat and everybody else is. Well, I did that to myself. Just get up with your coffee, pour coffee, shake hands, say hi, you know, and be active. How's that going to change? You know how many times I, I pull in somewhere else? Uh, I'll, I'll go down to Meyer instead of J.C. And you may say, well, that's a better choice anyway. But in J.C. is my circle of influence. I mean, I, not that I'm a celebrity, but I walk in there, man, and it's just every other single person in there I know. And I'll just go to Meyer because I can go in there and just not know anybody. And if I do, I can skip around and get away from them so I can just be alone. You know how many times Marcy called me and said, hey, you near J.C.? And I'll just turn around at Marathon and say, yeah, but I'll go back to Meyer. I'm just not going in there. It's going to be an hour if I walk in that place. And people are going to talk to me and ask me to pray for them. And that's my whole existence, man. That's what God's called me to. But you know what I just like? Just be alone. Just be alone. Just going to get on my horse and ride out in the woods and do what? Just disappear from society. Well, you better be walking with God out there. You're just wasting wasting everybody's time. Go out there and refresh. If you're going to do that, come back and get to work for God. And he won't listen to him. But this morning, Travis was here. Well, he opened. He I seen his car turn here and go that way. And I thought in my mind, I was like, oh, imagine that. And I seen him walk around to the back door. And I was like, get out. He walked, he walked in and looked at me, and I was just like, the ceiling's not falling down, you know. If I come in there, the whole building will fall down. You know, and he, he didn't sit in the back. He come right up here and sit down. I mean, on a string. And then he was like that. I mean, every word. We got done. And he hugged me in the back, and he said, man, he goes, I, I didn't know church was like that. I mean, I knew all kinds of people there. This I'm coming back. This was awesome. This was awesome. I love this. Man, people were friendly. Oh, man, I needed this. I needed I needed this. You know, and just on and on. And I was just like, just taking the time. Paul is taking the time. He's telling Timothy, hey, when things go crazy, don't strategize. Go back to what you've been taught. Live for the Lord. Look, mark the things that I did well and do those things. There was a steadfastness in his learning. Continue thou. But there was a substance in the things that thou hast learned. There's every, it seems like on, on both ministry groups that I'm in on Facebook, everybody's looking for something new that will shake up the foundations of, of visitors coming to their church and how they, the new thing of today, and it's really probably not new, but it, it's, you know, most people probably don't even know what's going on, but it's branding, how things are branded, how it's branded, what kind of logo you have, you know, what color things are, do they match, branding, branding, how do we brand, how do you brand this, how do you brand that, how did this happen when you started this? I mean, it's just, and I'm just like, you market Jesus by getting out there and just talking about Jesus and loving the Lord. And that's how he's best best marketed. You know, we're not selling branding, but that, but lost people, that's what they see first. I mean, that's, that's how things are marketed, Leslie. I mean, that's what they see. It's branding. So they're looking for strategy. You know, one of the strategies is just be in the world, but don't be of the world. Like, I can sit at home on my back porch at night and do nothing, or I can go to a ball game. Uh, last ball game was that. I didn't even make it to where we was going to sit till the second half of the second game. Because somebody grabbed my arm and set me down next to them, and I was with a whole group of older ladies. And they wanted to talk about the church, about my grandkids, see pictures, see stuff they've seen on Facebook. What are we doing? How's the church doing? Things are growing. What's going on? I mean, just talk and talk and talk. I could have just sat at home. But I got down there, and, and I was like, I want to be an encouragement to this group. I talked to somebody there that's been in board in their whole life. They visited our church. And they said, man, we have visited the churches. And 
There might be some Bible stuff, but there's no invitation for salvation at all. It's like the first time I came into the church, she said there was a presence of God. She goes, it's the first church I've been into since I was a child that had an invitation for salvation. She's like, it wasn't one, two, three, follow me into the pool of baptism and then you're going to heaven. She goes, but literally there was a gospel message with a gospel presentation. And she asked me. And you will be like, oh, come on. But l listen to me. She asked me, do you think there's anybody in Borden that's saved? That was her question to me. Now, obviously, I think there are some people that are saved, but I think all of us are going to be surprised probably how many are. It is just branding and hodgepodge Christianity. Trying to market. He tells him, have some substance, the things which thou hast learned. I passed a couple this morning on the way in town, and this is a guy who's grown up in fundamental circles, and I know where they're headed this morning. When I passed them, I didn't, I never put two and two together. And when I passed him and his new wife, I was like, where are they going? Now, you've got to be kidding me. They're going where she goes? They're not going where he goes? Are you kidding me? Like, he knows that where he's going there will never be the presentation of the gospel. And where he was, they're presenting the gospel. But you get unequally yoked, and those things take place. Now they're doing what? They're going to church. For what? And people say to me all the time, well, it's better to go to church than just not go anywhere. I'm like, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I do not know. Pick out a church and go to the one of your liking. Timothy had learned about Christ and the gospel and eschatology and God and false teachers and a host of matters the world does not think important. The world is learning many things, but most of what they learn are unimportant compared to eternal matters. And then lastly, the sureness of his lear learning. Look there in verse 14, it says, But continue in the, in the things which thou hast learned and has been assured of. You know what he's seen? He's seen those things work. He's seen them work. He's seen the power of God. He's seen the move of God. He's, he's been with Paul during this time of teaching and these afflictions and the sufferings and persecutions. And, and so there is a sureness of learning. Timothy knew these things were certain. If there's any knowledge that you need to know with certainty of spiritual knowledge, no knowledge is so important, therefore no knowledge needs to be known. I mean, he had learned these things from a child. Look at, uh, they've been sending us these pictures of Judah. And uh, Marcy asked me a while back, she said, if each one of our kids has two kids and we have ten grandkids, how are we going to love them all the same? You know, and I was like, I, I don't know that we will, to be honest with you. One of them ain't going to be no good, I'm sure, if we have ten of them. And so, uh, what did he say? It'll be Sam's. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. He's gonna have to. He'll have to get married first. <laughs> what? Okay. Yeah. He said that's not gonna be hard. All right. <laughs> <laughs> they ask at the youth right last year. Is anybody here that that's handsome and good looking? And Sam stood up and stood up and put his hands in his pockets. She goes, how are we going to love him the same? And, oh, yeah. Yeah, he's many Marcy. And so he, so I've been sending these videos, videos of Judah. I, I, was, I will say, I mean, I love the kids in this church, and I'm probably, I'm way more patient than I used to be with them. But since this little, this group of babies has been born, like, I like to get my hands on them. I, Carrie walked in the other day with Carson, and or not Carson, with Asen, and pow, you know, I just took him, and off we went. Uh, Brittany was back there the other day with Carson and said, feel how heavy he is, and pow, I just took him, and off I went. I know you're probably not looking forward to it, but I'm looking forward to a Wednesday night when I just hold Judah in my hand and, and preach the word, and he can just stay, Marcy's saying no, because she's going to hold him, but he can he just be present during the preaching, and while the preaching's gone, and I think about what Savannah and Aaron are going to teach him about the Lord, but I think about how we're going to 
assist and assure that because we're going to teach him the very same things. You know, he's sitting on my lap the other day and he started crying and Savannah goes, you want me, you want me to take him? I was like, no. And I turned him and looked at him and you say, man, it's weird, but I just watched him cry as I was holding him. And he saw her and he wanted her. And I said, no, he needs to know he'd be all right with me. So I stood up and walked around with him, calmed him down, and then I handed him to her. And I was like, every time he sees you, he doesn't need to cry. And I know that's natural for a mom or whatever. And that makes the mom feel good too and all that. He needs me and all that business is going on. But I was just like, man, I've already lifted your name up more in prayer than you probably will pray for yourself in a lifetime. Not only what his mother had taught him, but man, what his grandmother had taught him. Hey, you know your mom's right. You know you should. You only got one command. You need to obey your parents and do right. God's not going to bless you if you act like that. The times that Timothy walked out on the back porch of their home and there was his grandmother praying to the Lord and he just stood and and watched her. Who are you talking to? I'm talking to the Father. Where is he? He's in heaven. There's great theology in that stuff right there. You know, they wouldn't have had a Bible, but the times he's going to get to walk in and say, you know, Grandpa, why do you got all that writing and all of those post-it notes, you know, and all of that stuff written in your Bible? Those are things I'm learning about the Lord. You know, those are the things that, that God has taught me over the years. Well, Dad thinks we ought to. Well, your dad's right. You should. Paul says to Timothy, of those things, there's a sureness in your name. It wasn't that his mom was trying to teach him everything she didn't know. His grandmother was there too. And you know what happened when he went on the field with Paul? The things he had been taught. I think that's what, when Timothy became a convert, and we assume that maybe he was the convert of Paul, and so Paul saw him as a son but Timothy had this advantage because he had this training that had taken place all of these years before. And he was advanced for a baby, for a baby Christian. And, he, and so Paul took him and did what? He just developed him as a young man for the Lord. I mean, we send them off, and I'll give my plug. The church today waits till they grow up and then sends them off to Bible college to be trained for the ministry the church should be doing the training friends they should be getting their training right in their church and from the people that they're churching with with the homes that they live in and the youth nights and they should be getting their church right and their training right in the church and they should be trained up and ready to be ready to serve the Lord and that's how it should work. And then what? They reinvest right back into that ministry till God moves them somewhere. You know, we've set up these training centers and the training centers take them. And I'm not against them, but they take them if they're good. You know, or if they have a hole that to fill, they'll plug them in there. And, and it's the small churches that are training young people for the Lord that are sending them away. And then they're disappearing. And the small churches are suffering where you can have some great servants. We've got... Young people that are just ready to serve the Lord and ready to do something. They, they said last year after they went to the teen retreat, you know, when we got back from the teen retreat, the teens were just like, hey, we had a good time at the teen retreat, but we don't, we don't want to do that anymore. And I know some of them still want to go, and they can, and that's between them or whatever. What do you want to do? They want to go to Dunkirk. They go up there and work and serve. You know, look at Vacation Bible School, and I know we're, we're indoctrinating them as well with the Word of God, but I've had some of them express to me, I don't mind sitting over and being taught, but I come to church three days, uh, three services a week, every week. I'd like to be like be in Vacation Bible School teaching and praying and right along with them. You know, my, my kids are chomping at the bit to be 18 so they can, whenever I get 18, what can I do? 
because it's like they're not adults yet. We've held them back, and we're like, man, there's some, you know, legality and all this stuff. But that's the way that it should be. Paul's telling Timothy, you're young, but you're ready. I'm going to be gone. I, the second book, he's we're here. He's going to finish his course at the end of chapter four. I finished my course. I've run the race. Like I'm done, and I'm passing the torch to you. He doesn't say good luck. Good luck. I wish I'd have taught you more. He says, no. Go back to the things that you've been taught and do them. And when the, ships get, when the ship gets out of course, go back to the things that you've been taught and do them. I mean, every, every relationship, every marriage, every walk with God, every starts at the same place. You know, you can ask yourself, are you praying like you should? Probably not. Are you reading the Word of God? Probably not. When you're doing those things, come back to me, and then we'll talk about what the problem is. Because I promise you, if you're doing those things, God's probably already working, and you won't need to come see me. Well, I just need more training. Well, we have three services a week, and if you see me three times a week, you probably won't want to see me no more than that. Now, where are you tonight if you need more training? Man, I got so much sin in my life, I need more than just... One day a week. Where are you at? Where are you at? Well, just, it, the day was pretty. See, that's what the devil has done. I'm going to pray for the rest of the year. It rains every Sunday. Every Sunday. Be beautiful on Saturday and just rain. Hope it snows every Sunday the rest of the year. <laughs> now, don't do that because when people stay home and say, the roads are too bad. You know, we got the time change. People can come back. Weather's going to get nice. We're going to pray that God continues to change. Lord, we come to you tonight. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for Timothy and Paul. Thank you for their example. Thank you for their desire of service. Lord, I, I don't see them as people that are unattainable or that we can't be servants alike. But I see them as examples to the believer, male and female, Lord, for service and for work. Lord, I pray that we would train up a child in the way he should go. So here in this time of Timothy, you know, if the dad passes away, if the, if the parents are tragically taken, Lord, if things wax worse and worse, that those children have a foundation to build their house on when it comes to the things of God. Help us as parents, grandparents, co-laborers with the families in our ministry. Lord, to teach the young people that we love them and the Lord loves them and they need to love their family. Thank you for that, Lord.